What's hard but also great about Blue Ridge is the pace of life here. Everything's a lot slower, a lot more relaxed, and you just have to learn to take it one step at a time. Just chill out a little bit, you're in Blue Ridge. Within 10 minutes from the center of Blue Ridge, you can be out in the middle of nowhere. We have 12 months a year trout fishing right here. Whether it's January or August, you can find cold water, you can find hungry trout. Um, we have the Atlanta airport an hour and a half away, we're easily accessible. I was in the photo industry down in Atlanta, um, but I, I came to Blue Ridge and I found a house the first weekend I came and I wanted to live here. So I had to make up a job. So this is what I made up. I think what happens here is we're in the foothills of the oldest mountains in the world. And there is a calling, there is a serious mojo to, to this area. And um, it really is beautiful. When I got here, uh, there was nothing. I mean, the shops were boarded up. Uh, I mean, it was like tumbleweeds down the street, and people had antique stores, which were just really junk out of their attic that, you know. And, um, you know, we came in, and then, you know, some other friends came in, and furniture stores started to happen, and, uh, you know, to supply the demand of the people that were moving up here to the magical area. There's a lot of passion up here, and I think that's what makes all of us comfortable and special, is that we're each doing our thing. Um, I work with winemakers and cheesemakers and brewers, and I know almost everybody I buy from, and these people care. You know, it matters. And so when, when customers come in, I love to show them something that's new. I love to, I just want somebody to like it as much as I do. And it, it just is, it feels great when that happens. It really does, you know that. I, I think it's fun to kind of taste something and think, well, what's happening here? Let's do this with that. And um, when you hit it, you know it. And when you miss, it's like, whoa, <laughs> let's don't do that, bad call. But I remember very, very explicitly the first time that happened to me and I had a 1965 Sauterne from France with a homemade foie gras, also from France. It was in a little can, unmarked, looked like an unmarked can of tuna. So it was pure fat and pure sugar. And I had that and I heard Beethoven and I thought, I get it now. And that started me on my quest, which I knew nothing when this all got going, you know? So it was fun. I come up with these ideas and I think about expanding, and I think, you know what? I work harder in here than most people see. I'm not an absentee owner. I am on the premises, you know, daily, and I love it. And, um, but people come in here to see me, and I want to see them, and I can't be two places at once. So I kind of see me just uh, riding this horse while it's standing. And I got a few more years to go, you know? I'm sending an inert gas into the bottle and the gas is displacing the wine. So what we're gonna do right here is have a little wine. Cheers. Smack, smack, that is good. <laughs> Go ahead. It's early, but it ain't early in Blue Ridge. All aboard! Our trip typically is a four-hour turn. 
takes us about one hour to travel from Blue Ridge to McKaysville along the river. Uh, we lay over here for two hours. Uh, folks have a chance to get off the train, have lunch, explore a lot of the shops in McKaysville and Copper Hill area, and back on the train at two o'clock, we're back in Blue Ridge by three. Yeah, my grandfather was a section foreman on the Chicago Northwestern in Northwestern Nebraska. I used to go and visit when I was eight, ten years old and watch trains come through town. This is trains as they were in the 30s and 40s. Uh, again, it's, it's a matter of, of restoring and maintaining this, this fleet of old passenger cars. Give people an opportunity to experience train riding. I think the, the biggest thing that the, our passengers go home with is the experience of interacting with our car hosts and other crew members as they uh, take the trip. You remind me of the song about for, for a little shiny quarter you can have the Pullman Porter turn the lights down low. <laughs> As the Pullman car shuffled off the buffalo, that's an old song, but yeah, yeah it, it's romantic. We, we get couples on the train, we get young married couples, and they just kind of sit there and hold hands, enjoy each other's company. We'd like to congratulate Justin and Megan, who are on their honeymoon today. Round of applause for them. You are newlyweds? We are. We, how long you been married? Since Sunday afternoon. Oh, wow. <laughs> Sunday, you're yeah. still on your honeymoon. We are. Oh. <laughs> you know, many years ago, 48 years ago, uh -huh. we took a trip. It wasn't our honeymoon trip, but it was about a year after we got married. You know, when you get married, you ain't got no money. <laughs> <laughs> and we rode, the, we rode the Union Pacific Railroad, okay. and we rode in a Pullman car. And that is a perfect place for a honeymoon, oh, by the way. <laughs> Railways can, even today, transport tons and tons and megatons of freight uh, in a very efficient manner. As far as our little railroad here, uh, it, it, people come and they look at the river and they look at the trees and the flowers and the blossoms, and it gives them an opportunity to, to see what North Georgia really looks like. Well, uh, when I retired from the corporate world, I started brewing at the house. And my wife threw me out of the house, so I set up a brewery in my outdoor shower. A couple of the restaurants downtown actually asked to taste our beer. And we said, okay, so we carried it down. And they said, the number one request from tourists is what's your local beer? And we really don't have one. So y'all ought to fire it up. And before we knew it, it blew up on us and we got like real jobs. So this was not planned. This had absolutely nothing to do with anything other than Blue Ridge Karma. You ready? We make brown ale, we make wheat ale, we make pale ale, we make IPA, we make imperial IPA, we make porter, and we make black IPA. That's what we distribute. And then we make a stout with Jameson whiskey in it that we drink, and then we make several other beers with fruit in it and stuff just for in here. We don't like it, we don't drink it, we don't drink it, we don't sell it, is our motto. And, um, and that's really it. We just make beer that we like, and if you happen to like it, that's great. If you don't happen to like it, that's okay. Because uh, we're not running this for any reason other than to have fun, be an integral part of Blue Ridge, and make good beer.
first of all, it's a good place to live. It's a nice lifestyle. But second of all, it's, it's full of what we call people in their second acts. So they've retired, most of us retired early. Uh, they've still got a lot to do, a lot to contribute. And everybody kind of works together and supports everybody and wants everybody to be a success. And Blue Ridge is just a, it's just a cool place that way. The, the tourists, the first thing they say, you can talk to any of them, they're all trying to figure out how to move here because they stay here for a week and they're just so relaxed and so laid back and, and so um, pleasant till they don't want to go home. two-hour-long trail rides. Uh, we got anything from uh, beginners up to your, uh, you know, your more skilled level riders. And we take them along the back roads up here of Hell's Holler. And then once we get to the end of the road, I'll tell them a little bit about Hell's Holler, you know, how it got its name and everything. It's uh, from back in the heyday from moonshining. You know, this was, uh, I guess they, you know, the law would consider a pretty rough area. You know, there was bootleggers that lived back in here, you know, back in the day, you know, uh, some pretty rough characters live back in these mountains, you know, had to live off the land. And uh, moonshining was part of, part of uh, their culture and uh, where they got their money. I mean, look, it's nothing but peace and quiet. And you get bored, you know, we jump on a horse and take off up on the mountain and ride around and see wildlife. We have a lot of wildlife here, uh, deer, um, a lot of deer on the property. Uh, we've had a mountain lion or two on the property. It's been a couple years ago, bear, they come through every now and again, but I mean, I don't see how you could see it would be a boring life. There's always something to do out here. A lot of land to take care of. A lot of animals to take care of. You could get used to it. Drifted off a few times whenever I was younger, working different different uh, jobs, and uh, no, the city ain't for me. I'd rather be in the country all day. I mean, look how peace and quiet it is. Could you do this in Atlanta? You wouldn't have this, would you? Horns honking, big wheels are rolling. This is Sally. She's the one I ride all the time. She's a real good mule. And then uh, we've got a smaller horse for the smaller, you know, smaller kids. This is not one of her ponies. This is just a smaller horse. And then we got right here, as I was telling you, uh, our bigger mules. But these are these are three mules. And then standing behind you here is all of our uh, different horses. We got anything from quarter horses. And then we've got your racking horses. And we've got Tennessee walkers. I'm gonna get on camera. You got to put love in them and take care of them. I mean, it's just like your pet dog. You know, except for we got a lot more of them and they're a lot bigger. But yeah, you gotta take care of them just like their family. They take care of us. All right. Guys, my name is Shannon. I'm gonna be your guide. I'm gonna go over uh, real quick how to set, ride, and drive your horse. Just make your horse follow mine. Pull it to the right a little bit. And then remember to lean forward. I came to be in Blue Ridge, Georgia via Clemson, South Carolina. I'm originally from the north and went to school down south and once I got the taste of it, I never went back. So the trapeze is my passion and it is my passion project. Um, it is something that I started a few years back and I travel all over the country to do it. Whenever I went on vacation, I'd always look to see if there was a trapeze there. And after traveling so much and spending a lot of money, I finally said, you know what, I just need my own trapeze rig and I put it in my backyard, which happens to be on Lake Blue Ridge. 
You're gonna see me do a few tricks. You'll see me swing on the trapeze. You'll see me do a uh, beginner trick, which will be the first trick you'll learn as a first time trapeze student. And that's a knee hang, all the way up to a, a layout in the air. I hope I'm here forever. I plan on uh, spending my dying days here. Well, my parents got married uh, in like 42, and they, after that, they, shortly after that, they bought this property. It was a, a community where everybody just congregated right here in this little area, and the, uh, all of our neighbors would come down here and we'd have picnics because we were right here by the water and my dad had all these picnic tables that were lined out all the way up the, in front of the house. And so people thought that it was a state park. It was really pretty then. We actually mowed the grass right into the river and had all those picnic tables there. So uh, we would go swimming. I, I learned to swim right here in the river, and that's, that's quite a challenge. Blue Ridge has so much to offer. There, you know, there's all kinds of things, and then my family's all we all like the outdoors anyway, and there's lots of outdoor stuff that you can do with all the waterfalls in the river is a, is a trout stream. It's a Georgia trout capital, and we're right here on the Tupelo River, so it's, there's lots of things to do here. You, you meet different people, people from everywhere, and it's just, it's been lots of fun. We've enjoyed it. Uh, my husband and I have been doing it now. Well, I started uh, uh, working full-time in 94, and so we, to, and I took ownership in uh, 09, and so I have been working the whole time. At night, after the guests go home, uh, we will get a one of the boats out and go down the river and enjoy that later in the afternoons, and that's fun. My mother and dad came here. My dad was actually a county agent, and he came to Fanning County uh, about 1942, and uh, they bought a little orchard that was here in about 43, and uh, we've been growing ever since. Well, we're about 300 acres of fruit, 
uh, we grow peaches and apples, strawberries, blueberries, and blackberries. So uh, we started out at about 15 or 20 acres, and we're at about 300 now. But we started out originally with me selling apples off the back of a wagon sitting on the side of the highway when they built the highway through here. We had a, a location, so me and my brother would sell apples out on the side of the road. And then from that point, we started adding a building and we've uh, grown since. In the early years, obviously, not everybody was traveling to the mountains and all. Uh, we didn't have uh, the big tourist business that is here today. And so we, most everything people grew up here, we shipped out. We shipped to Atlanta or to other places. Well, we're, we're in a good part of Georgia. I read an article one time that said if you wanted to find places where it would be great to visit or a great tourist location, find where they're growing apples because it's always nice, cool nights, warm days. You need lots of sunshine in the daytime because that's what it takes to grow good apples. Everybody had a little cider mill in the old days. Today, we make all the cider for all the apple houses in North Georgia. So the juice part was our first venture. And then, of course, we got into, well, why not make a pie? We make a juice, why not make a pie? And that's how we started. Our apple pie business is now bigger than our apple business. Well, we're very blessed up here that uh, whenever they laid everything out, they did Blue Ridge a big favor. They put about 50% of our land in National Forest land. So half of our county uh, will always be kind of mountainous and uh, wilderness area because that's the way it was set up. Oh, there's no way I would leave Blue Ridge. <laughs> We've been here all of our life and we love it. People like bamboo fly rods because it's part of the tradition of the American fly fisher. It was invented in the United States in the 1800s and for over a hundred years it was the worldwide standard as far as fly fishing tackle goes. So what's happened is we can't compete with modern synthetics as far as price goes because there's just too much skilled labor that goes into them. So the only market really left for uh, rod makers in the bamboo side is the higher end. Uh, when people buy a bamboo fly rod, they're looking for perfection. Fly fishing, it's like the bamboo rods. It's not because it's the most efficient or the least expensive or anything like that. It's the same with fly fishing in general. Uh, if you just want to catch fish, get some hooks and some worms and you can go catch fish. Can of corn, you can catch plenty of trout. Um, but it is, it's a traditional way to do it, and it's also, it's a beautiful way to do it. It's an artistic way to do it, especially when we're trying to do something like catch a fish that we're just going to turn loose anyway after we've done it. You know, it, it is totally a zen-like thing. There's nothing practical about any of it. We don't sell anything here that anybody needs. It's all want-based uh, business. Uh, we, we try not to kiss and tell with a lot of that, but we have made rods for, for presidents and celebrities and that sort of thing. So uh, we make, in fact is we make rods every year for people that we have no idea where they go. We have attorneys handle the deal and it goes through their office and we don't even know who our customer was. So uh, we do have some, some interesting clientele. Yeah, the, the material does come from China. In fact, since about 1900, every bamboo rod originated in the same 20 or 30 square miles in the whole world. Uh, but the reason for that is the physical properties of that one species of bamboo. It's a very, very tough material, and a lot of people don't realize bamboo has a higher tensile strength than steel does. So the strength per weight is even greater than steel is. And it's a natural growing material. It's harder than any wood, it's typically solid all the way through. You could take one of our rods, and, and they're so beautiful, people are afraid of them. They think that they're not practical fishing instrument. But the reality is you could lay it on the road, run over it with your car, pick it up and go fishing. Um, it's, a, it's a long process. It's um, even at the most efficient uh, setup, it's still, you're looking at 30, 40 or more hours to make a very basic rod.
Some of our rods with the engraving, with the hollow building, with the fancy wraps and things that we'll do to them special. Some of those rods, we have two and 300 hours into one rod. So um, I haven't made the perfect rod yet and I don't know that I ever will. Thank you.